Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Thank God for his faithfulness. Thank God for his goodness. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. God bless you. It just gets gooder and gooder, doesn't it? Amen, amen. Welcome to those of you joining us online, especially those of you for the first time. Please be sure to connect with us to the appropriate links there so that we can connect with you. And for anyone who might be here today for the very first time, you would do us a great honor and privilege to get to meet you over at the Welcome Center immediately after the service today. Hope you'll stop in and say hello. Uh, welcome to more new members in the uh, 8.30 service. Uh, we brought in 29 in the 10.30 service last Sunday, and we brought in 10 more in the 8.30 service this morning. 39 new members. I don't know what the interest is in membership all of a sudden. I, I, just, I just don't know. You're supposed to be laughing at that. You're supposed to. But uh, we thank God for uh, the new members and for the growth. Happy birthday to Pastor Ryan, to Denise Crokin, to Rachel Wong. Happy birthday to all of you celebrating birthdays today. Um, I want to encourage you to be here next Sunday. Next Sunday, I have a message just for one person. Say, Pastor Jim, do you ever preach a sermon just for one person? I'm going to do it next Sunday. And the message is to Pastor Jamie. But I think it's important that you be here too. There might be something in that message you need to hear. So I hope you'll all be here next Sunday. And if you don't like the sermon, you go, well, at least that was for Pastor Jamie. That wasn't for me. But uh, <laughs> hope you'll be here. And uh, well, it seems like somebody said, Pastor Tim, it just seems like, uh, oh, an annual business meeting. Don't forget next Sunday, five o'clock annual business meeting. Seems somebody said, Pastor Tim, it just seems like there's so much change going on around here. And, and of course, that's, that's true, isn't it? And uh, Pastor Brigham uh, took a new assignment down in Weymouth uh, at the end of last year. And I'll have the privilege of installing him officially as a senior pastor there in Weymouth on May 19th. The evening of May 19th, Pastor Clark will be getting ordained. And then the next Sunday, uh, May 26th, uh, I'll be installing the Lord uh, the Lord leading us. I'll be installing Pastor Jamie here as a new lead pastor. Some reason he doesn't want to go with senior pastor. I don't understand that, but he's going to be the lead pastor. And, and, um, and so, and then Pastor Vinny went and retired on us. And uh, of course he's been facing some physical challenges, but uh, he's through one surgery and doing well. And, and uh, just keep praying for Pastor Vinny and, and Mary. They're watching online and uh, one more surgery to go, but just trusting God for his complete health and full full recovery. Amen. And then, of course, the announcement the first, uh, the first week of January uh, that uh, Jackie and I would be stepping aside from the senior leadership role here at Calvary. So, uh, yeah, a lot of change taking place, uh, and certainly uh, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. So, so we're going to talk about change a little bit today. And, you know, part of our resistance, uh, someone came up to me uh, after the first service and said, thank you, Pastor Tim, for that sermon about my least favorite word, <laughs> change, change. Part of, our, part of our reluctance or resistance to change is because it makes us feel a little insecure and uncertain about the future, uncertain about what the changes will bring. The truth of the matter is we have no idea what the future holds but we do know who holds the future in his hands. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Amen. And whatever changes that God might bring our way, we can be assured that they are changes for our good. Changes to help us. Changes to make us better. Changes to make us more like Jesus and trust in him more. Uh, Pastor Kendra, who's doing well at home now, our, our grandchild, our fourth grandchild is now two, a little over two weeks old and so far so good. Everything's going well and I'm changing diapers, feeding the baby, getting up in the middle of the night. And, and if you believe any of that, I'll tell you a few more stories, but, uh, <laughs> but so far so good. Pastor Sterling is back to work and so uh, uh, welcome back, Pastor Sterling. But, but Pastor Kendra... Uh, as a child, I think it's true even now, she and Kimberly both, they were not fans of change. Don't like change. They like tradition. They like a certain amount of ritual. They like uh, doing the same thing, uh, 
like going to the same place on vacation at the same time every year, things like that. And when the church began to grow back in the 90s, and it became apparent that we we're going to have a building program, and, and uh, the decision was made that we needed to move out of the parsonage over here. What is now our office building used to be the parsonage. We lived there from 1988 to 1997. And of course, it was the only home that Kendra, uh, having been born in, in, in 91, it's the only home she ever knew. And when she got the news that it looked like we were going to move, she was not a happy camper until we showed her this picture. Now, it wasn't actually this picture we showed her, but we showed her what this picture is representing. Uh, that is now the backyard of Tom and Katie Martinello, uh, who are members of our staff. But, but that, that used to be the backyard. Now, this is the backyard of the current parsonage, where we live now, looking into the backyard of our next door neighbor. Uh, who now is the Martinellos. But back in 1997, the next door neighbors living in that house, their daughter was Kendra's best friend. And when we told her that we were moving to a house where the backyard that connected to our backyard was the backyard of her best friend, all of a sudden she became a fan of change. <laughs> then she was in favor of making a move to a better place. And loved ones, while all changes, while all change is not necessarily good, when the changes are ordained of God, we can rest assured that the change will be good and that God is moving us to a better place. So our focus today is on the subject of change and we'll talk about it a little bit in regards to our corporate change, the change that's coming for us as, as a church family. But I want to also apply the subject of change to where each of us are individually in our walk with the Lord or our need to get engaged in a walk with the Lord and how there may just be some areas where he's still wanting to see some changes in our lives. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and say, I think he's talking to you today. I think he's talking <laughs> to you today. <laughs> turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read the first 14 verses, New International Version today. Here's what we read, the Apostle Paul writing. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is as a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Talk about being blunt and direct. Who's Paul talking about here? He's talking about uh, the, the Jewish leadership who wanted to keep people, even though they had become new believers in Jesus Christ in a personal relationship with him, there were those who wanted to still make salvation conditional on keeping all the Old Testament uh, ritual ceremony, all the Old Testament laws, including the, the, the requirement of circumcision. And so that was, of course, a, 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 a statement of faith between Abraham and God as they established their relationship. But with the coming of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, circumcision was no longer necessary, as well as a lot of other rules and regulations that nobody could adequately keep. And yet there were those who kept trying to tell them, if you're going to really be a believer, if you're going to really be right with God, you've got to do all these rules and regulations. And there are still some of these, well, let me use Paul's words dogs, evildoers, who teach this today, who teach a legalism that none of us can keep up with, that none of us can achieve. If it were possible for us to be good enough to merit heaven by being good enough, then Jesus would not have had to die on the cross for you and me. So that's who Paul is talking so bluntly about here. He says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Verse 3, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit. Notice the transition that's taking from an Old Testament ritualistic religion. Those uh, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. We have no confidence in the flesh today, loved ones. Only in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Although Paul says in verse 4, I myself have reasons for such confidence. He's going to go on to say here, you know, if, you, if it's based on how good you are and how many qualifications you meet, well, let me share with you some of my qualifications. And here he goes. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
Verse five, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Imagine. And if there, each of those things were things that were like meeting special qualities and qualifications. And he's saying, I got all these quality, all qualifications. This is why I'm qualified. But, and even faultless. I mean, who of us could say we are faultless when compared up against the law? But look at what Paul says next, verse seven. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth. Oh, I can't preach on this today, but don't miss it. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That is our basis today for righteousness. It's faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I want to know Christ, verse 10. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, all of that's backdrop for what is essentially our text today, the next three verses. Here we go. Verse, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Committed to change. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for a word of prayer? Father God, thank you for another awesome day that you have made that we can gather around your eternal and almighty word. Holy Spirit, come and teach us what no man can teach us. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive that truth that you desire to impart into us today, and then hands and mouths and feet of, of faith that will respond in obedience to that which you have taught us. Hide your servant behind the cross, we pray, and may Jesus Christ be high and lifted up, for it's in his matchless name we pray, and everyone said amen, amen. and amen. Committed to change. Let me give you three reasons to make a commitment to change today. Number one, Number one, change keeps me from living in the past. That was worth the price of interest right there. Change keeps me from living in the past. Paul says in Philippians 3.13, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, refer, referring to all of God's best for him. He says, God has so much for me, so much for you. And he says, I haven't, I haven't laid hold of all of it yet. I haven't arrived yet. I'm not perfect yet. But boy, I'm, I'm, I'm going after it. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Now today, somebody needs to forget what should be left behind. Somebody needs to forget about yesterday. The good and the bad. Either way, sometimes the good is an enemy of the best. But he says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Paul says, I was, a part of an, I was a part of an old religious system that did not work. I did everything I was supposed to do, even exceeding most. Went to church, paid my tithes, became a teacher, did a lot of things that I thought were good. But they brought me no satisfaction, no fulfillment, and most importantly, did not draw me into a closer relationship with God. Why? Because everything was based on religious, ritual, and human performance. But our salvation is not based on what we do for God. Our salvation is based on what God has done for us. Hallelujah. Paul got this revelation by, from Jesus Christ himself when Jesus knocked him off his horse or, or donkey or camel, whatever he was riding on the road to Damascus. And Paul was marvelously saved and given an insight and understanding into this salvation by grace through faith, which he writes about in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Some of you listening to me today may have come out of a religious background or experience 
where you were taught that getting right with God or making it to heaven was based on your good works. And you tried doing all the right things and you said all the appropriate prayers and you lit a lot of candles, but, but none of it has brought you peace of mind, heart, and soul. Why? Because Jesus does not want you to be a religious person. Jesus wants you to be a relational person and to have a personal relationship with him as your personal Lord and Savior. Amen. After all, he's the one who died on the cross of Calvary to pay the price for your sins. And now he offers you life and he offers it to you more abundantly if you'll leave your old religious systems and start a relationship with him by putting your faith and trust in him, by receiving his grace, his forgiveness, and his peace for your life. But that will require a commitment to change. It will require leaving the past and doing something new as God leads you. A change that res will result in you leaving an old religious ritual and, and, and beginning on a new path that involves a relationship with Jesus. That's going to require change. But again, we don't like change. And for all of us, even if you didn't come out of that religious system, all of us, we just have things that we kind of rely on and depend upon. And even though we're coming to understand they don't really provide the fulfillment we were hoping they're not accomplishing what we were hoping, uh, we still kind of hang on to them when there are so many things that God wants to change in our lives. Last Monday, April 8th, marked three years since I had my heart attack. And like thousands of other people who have a heart attack, I went through rehab, was given some instructions on things that needed to change. Things like exercising regularly, eating an appropriate diet, regularly getting a good night's rest, and losing weight. Who knew those things were important? <laughs> and like thousands of others who went through the same thing, uh, I promised I would do better, and I did for a while. Well, I saw my cardiologist, or actually my cardiologist assistant, on April 2nd, and let's just say she was, she was not much fun to be with. <laughs> she was not too happy with me, and she said, without any diplomacy, kindness, or sweetness, she said, we have noticed that you've gained some weight. And I said, well, if you wouldn't weigh me every time I came in here, you wouldn't know that. I always say to the first person that greets me, say, let's get your weight. I said, that's not a very good way to start our relationship, you know? <laughs> Imagine going on a date with someone and saying, let's, let's weigh each other, you know? I says. <laughs> well, she said my EKG was okay, but she also asked me to wear a heart monitor for the next two weeks, which I've still got on today. And she scheduled me for some, over, uh, some other test. I said, I thought you said my EKG was okay. She says, it is okay but we still want you to wear this monitor and we're still going to take some other tests in a couple of weeks. Loved ones, why is it that we fail to change when we know we need to change? Because change is not easy. In fact, change can be very hard. And I wonder how many have had someone say to you, perhaps someone who loves you and cares about you a great deal, have you heard them say to you in frustration, aren't you ever going to change? Unfortunately, it often takes something drastic, like a heart attack, to get our attention. And then even that, for some, is not enough. Pray that I'll make some progress in this area during my upcoming sabbatical. It really, really needs to happen. And uh, although my best friend said to me, I'll pray for you, but you got to do the work. You know, thank God for best friends. Huh? <laughs> Commitment to change keeps us from living in the past. So let's take a, a minute to apply this to our church during this time of transition in leadership. A lot of churches die because they want to keep living in the past. The problem is that they live in the past at the expense of the present and possibilities for the future. And for most of us, particularly those of us in the older generation, the changes we do not like have to do more with methods and styles rather than the actual message itself. Exhibit number one or exhibit, exhibit A, of course, would be music. 
Music is always a sensitive subject because we all like the music of our generation. I mean, the music from my generation was the best music. It was the most spiritual and godly music. You know, why can't this next generation understand this? And ironically, we tend to forget how that when we were younger, our parents' generation didn't like our music either. The recent Jesus Revolution movie, I know I've referenced it in a sermon recently, depicts how many, if not most, churches had a hard time dealing with the hippies getting saved back in the 1960s and 70s. Here's a picture of some of them on the screen. Men coming to church with their long hair. The women wearing holy jeans, which of course is back in style these days. Uh, most of them in bare feet and on and on the list goes. And the churches that welcomed the hippies without making their style an issue were also the churches that effectively shared with them the unchanging message of Jesus Christ and his love and grace and mercy. But the churches that did not accept the hippies because of their style forfeited the opportunity to share the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ with them. One group of churches grew during that time, while other churches missed one of the greatest times of spiritual harvest in the history of our country. Some things, some things need to change, while other things must never change. And of course, here we refer to the message itself. The message must never change. The authority of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ is our message. That has not changed in my 35 and a half years of preaching. And I can say with full confidence that that will not change under the preaching and teaching of Pastor Jamie Booth. Amen. Keep clapping because uh, after I say the next thing. <laughs> but changes in methods and means... Changes in style, oh, those will surely come. And I'll be sitting in the cheap seats enjoying watching. <laughs> in fact, the change has already started. I mean, I haven't even handed off the official baton of leadership to Pastor Jamie yet, and he's already making changes. He informed us in staff meeting recently that we are moving away from one computer program uh, uh, called Dropbox, uh, maybe some of you have heard of that, to use another one. And when I heard this, I did not say this out loud, though I'm going to do it now, <laughs> but I'm thinking in my head, I do not like this change. It's taken me 10 years to learn how to use Dropbox, <laughs> and now you're going to change it on me? How long is it going to take me to learn a new computer program? Because that's what change is all about. It's about learning. And furthermore, all my sermons are in Dropbox. What if by some freak computer accident, I lose all my sermons? My life will be over. <laughs> but then came the game changer. Then came the clincher when Pastor Jamie said, this change is going to save the church nine thousand dollars a year in other words if we do not change it's going to cost us it's going to cost us so let me make the spiritual application and ask you this question today my friend what is it that you need to change and what is your refusal to change costing you today what is it in your life that's costing you every day because you will not change? What is it in your life? What, 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 what cost are you paying spiritually for not changing? What cost are you paying perhaps in your marriage or some other relationship because you will not change? I challenge you today, commit to change. It will keep you from living in the past. Number two, change keeps me growing in the present. Change keeps me growing in the present. Paul writes in Philippians 3, 12 and 13, not, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. 
Brothers and sisters, I do not. He says it multiple times here. I haven't arrived. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. What is Paul saying to us? He is saying repeatedly, repeatedly, I have not arrived yet. I still need to change. In other words, I still need to grow. The great apostle Paul said, I still need to grow. I still need to change. And while change is inevitable, please understand growth is optional. Well, that's worth repeating. While change is inevitable, growth is optional. Growth is a choice. The fact of the matter is everything around you is changing. Your family, your friends, your job or business, your community, your culture, even your church family now is changing. Everything's changing, but not everything is changing in a good way or a positive way or a way in which we would call it growth. Healthy growth, that requires a choice. That requires a commitment, which is part of the reason that we here at Calvary offer all kinds of options and opportunities every three months for us to grow together. As we offer a whole new slate of classes and Bible studies, new small groups, prayer meetings, men and women's breakfast ministry opportunities, things like cleansing stream and celebrate recovery to help us in areas where we are struggling to change. And yet with all those opportunities for growth, and positive change, the overwhelming majority of people choose to stay the same rather than to commit to growth and change, especially the ones that need it the most. Paul says, change keeps me growing. I recognize I need to keep growing. Proverbs 27, 17 is iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Ephesians 4, 16, from him, that is Jesus, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. What are the scriptures telling us? They are telling us we need to grow and we grow better together. We grow better together. So where do you need to grow today? You already know. It's already in your head. You know exactly where you need to change. You know exactly where you need to grow. What needs to change in your life in order for you to continue to grow and live a victorious, overcoming Christian life. You have a choice to make. You have a decision to make. You have a commitment to make. Commit to change today. It will mean a commitment to growth. Pastor Jamie, one of the biggest challenges you will face as the new lead pastor at Calvary Christian Church is convincing people, especially church people, (laughs) that we need to change. And we need to change regularly. Years ago, I know you've heard the story before. A lady stood up in the middle of the service, interrupted me while I was speaking. And and I'm sure her intent was good, but she was just really, really wicked out of order and and just making a a mess of things. And and so I had to, as politely as I could, ask her to sit down and be quiet. (laughs) And after the service, she came running up to me and Pastor Guy Miller was an associate at the time. And we trained the pastors. If someone's coming after a pastor, you better get there beside him real quick and, you know, play defense. And, um, and I mean, she was just kind of going up one side of me and down the other, how wrong I was to correct her, certainly to correct her publicly uh, even though she was the one that interrupted me publicly, but, but, but you know, and how, how I was wrong and she was right because she told me I'm always right. <laughs> Pastor guy went like this. <laughs> Come again. She said, I have reached a state of mature perfection. <laughs> and I said, wow, that's amazing. And then I said, You really, sister, you need to find a new church where the pastor is at least as spiritual as you are. Because I can assure you, I am not perfect. 
I have not arrived. I am not always right. In fact, the apostle Paul himself, the great apostle Paul, said I haven't arrived yet. So, so you really need to find a church, you know, where the pastor's at least as spiritual as you are. And, and thankfully, she moved on to another church and another pastor. God bless him. Here's the deal. Calvary Christian Church has not arrived yet either. Hello? God's been good to us. God's been faithful. We have, a, we have a lot to celebrate over the last 35 plus years. We've been committed to growth in every way, making whatever changes were necessary to keep growing, whether it was adding multiple services or, or planting churches and sending missionaries around the world. But we haven't arrived yet. We haven't accomplished all that God has for us to do. And that makes me even more excited to, to consider what God has in store for us in the days ahead. Which leads me to our last point today as the musicians come. Change not only keeps us from living in the past and keeps us growing in the present, but change keeps me excited about the future. What does the Apostle Paul say in Philippians 3.14? He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul saying, I'm excited about the future I have in Christ. I'm excited because I have a goal. I'm excited because uh, 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 that goal includes a prize. And not only the prize of Jesus Christ himself, what greater prize is there than that? but also the prize of accomplishing and becoming all that Christ would have me to accomplish and become in this life. And loved ones, isn't that really what everyone wants and longs for? Even those outside of a personal relationship with Christ acknowledge a longing and yearning within themselves for significance. But even that significance begins with the commitment to change. The commitment of a surrendered life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it just gets better from there. I mean, talk about excitement. Is there any excitement greater than the excitement of a new convert, a new believer? Oh, if people, if we have, if we just never get away from focusing on people coming to Christ, there, there's always, I mean, we just got a baby in our house. I mean, a lot of excitement. Excited about, we're talking about the future. Well, when are we going to do this? And, and, you know, and of course in our house, when's the next trip to Disney? Good grief. But, uh, you, you know, you get excited. New converts bring that excitement. Why? Because God's just done something miraculous in them. And they are excited about their future and what God has in store for them. If you're not excited about the future, perhaps it's because you've wavered in your commitment to change. By wavering in your commitment to change, you've wavered in your faith. The faith walk isn't exciting for you anymore because you, you just stop growing and stop changing, stop learning. You see, the longer you delay in obeying God and inviting him to make the changes in your life that he desires, the longer you're walking in disobedience to him. Thank you for all those amens. I know it's near the end of the sermon. Okay, I'll say it again. The longer... You delay in obeying God and inviting him to make the changes in your life that he desires, the longer you're walking in disobedience to him. The longer you're outside of God's will and best desires for your life, when in fact he has something so much better for you than what you're currently selling for. I would never have become who I am today. The pastor, the shepherd, the leader, if I did not commit to change and trust God for the future. Again, you've heard the story many times. Leaving my home in Virginia in 1985, leaving my father and the church we'd pastored together for many years, all the hopes and dreams for building a great church crushed. Gone. Struggling to make sense out of what God was doing in our lives. But, but Jackie and I left there to come to a foreign mission field known as Massachusetts. <laughs> where I would be mentored by Pastor Berkey at Bethany Assembly of God in Agawam and more fully equipped and prepared for my pastoral ministry here in Linfield. And though the circumstances are so very different now, there's no question that it's been a step of faith for Jackie and me 
to commit to this change. You see, I've been working with pastors for a long time now. In my estimation, and this is just my opinion, in my estimation, young pastors quit too soon. They get discouraged from mistakes they've made and the church isn't growing as fast as they'd like it to grow. And young pastors tend to quit too soon. They not allowing the laws of the harvest to kick in and to per persevere until they begin to reap what they have sown. Only really considered resigning one time in 35 years. And that was early on about three to four years into my pastorate here. And for those very reasons, I just felt like, you know, I'm not doing a very good job and things aren't happening quick enough. And maybe I'll just quit. On the other hand, it's also my estimation that older pastors tend to stay on too long. Now, again, I'm making broad generalizations here. There's exceptions to every rule. God's timetable for a pastor may be 10 years in one place, 20 in another, 30 in another, 40 in another. So this is a broad generalization I'm making. But I've worked with enough pastors to arrive at this opinion. Older pastors tend to stay on too long. A lot of reasons, perhaps for some it's a matter of financial reasons. Others trying to hang on to the glory days of the past. Oh, you don't know the glory days of the 1990s. Wooden pews, no air conditioning, worn out carpet. I mean, you missed the glory days. But you know, maybe an unhealthy codependency between pastor and parishioners. I could talk about that for a long time. Sometimes a pastor is too insecure to allow input and influence from the next generation. Or in many cases, I think it's simply a failure to recognize that the time has come for another voice to be heard. And I think pastors forget that the decisions we're making are not just about ourselves. We're making decisions about what's best for the kingdom of God. Amen. And more specifically, to our context here in Linfield, what is best for Calvary Christian Church? I said the first Sunday of the new year, we've had a pretty good run the last 35 and a half years. We can rejoice over what God has done in the past, what he's even doing right now. Things have never been better. While acknowledging as well that God wants to take us from something that's pretty good to something that's pretty great. I was talking with a 76 year old businessman uh, a week or so ago, member of our church, very successful businessman. And he said to me, Pastor Tim, I am, listen to the word he used, I'm excited. Last point, change keeps me excited about the future. He said, I'm excited about where God is going to take us under Pastor Jamie's leadership. No offense to you, Pastor, love you, your teaching, your leadership, but I think God wants to take us to the next level under Pastor Jamie. To which I said, amen. Amen. We serve a great and mighty God, Calvary. He tells us to call upon him and he will show us great and mighty things we do not even know. He asked the question, who knows what the spirit has in store for us? Paul tells us in Ephesians 3.20 to look to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We serve a God who wants to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. So let's keep asking. Let's keep imagining. And let's keep our hands to the plow as the power of God works in us and through us for the advancement of his kingdom. I close with this story. It's an old story, illustration, but I've not uh, shared it in many, many years and perhaps you've not heard it in many, many years. It's a true story told by a next Navy officer who was on the bridge of the largest battleship of the fleet with his captain one dark and stormy night. Two battleships assigned to the training squadron had been at sea on maneuvers in heavy weather for several days. I was serving on the lead battleship, said the ex-Navy officer, and was on the bridge keeping, uh, and was on the bridge as a night 
uh, as the night fell. The visibility was poor with patchy fog, so the captain remained on the bridge keeping an eye on all the activities. Put that picture of the ship on the screens if you would. Shortly after dark, the lookout on the wing of the bridge reported light bearing on the starboard bow. Is it steady or moving astern, the captain called out. Lookout replied, steady, captain, which meant we were on a dangerous collision course with that ship. The captain then called to the signalman, signal that ship. We're on a collision course. Advise you change course 20 degrees. Back came a signal. Advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. The captain said, send this message. I'm a captain. Change your course 20 degrees. I'm a seaman second class, came the reply. You'd better change course 20 degrees. By that time, the captain was furious. He spat out, send this message. I'm a battleship. Change your course 20 degrees. Back came the flashing light. I'm a lighthouse. Suggest you change course <laughs> 20 degrees. We changed course. Jesus is our lighthouse. And his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. I recommend this light to you today and suggest that you commit to changing course in whatever areas of your life that he's making clear to you today need to change. And I challenge Calvary Christian Church to keep your eyes on the light and remain committed to whatever changes he would lead us into in the days ahead. It will keep us from living in the past. It will keep us growing in the present and it will keep us excited about the future. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me for a word of prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're done in 60 seconds. Let me speak first to those who need to make some changes so you can stop living in the past. Start moving on to something better that God's got for you. Maybe you're stuck in a religious tradition rather than a relationship with Jesus. Would you change your ways today and come to Jesus? Begin to live a new life that only Jesus can give you. You can't get there on the road you're on now. You need to change course and begin to follow Jesus. Would you make that change today? Then there are those who need to commit to an ongoing change in the present. Don't you get tired of not growing? Don't you get tired of not changing? Not having your soul and spirit enlarged? Commit to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Commit to growing with others here in the body of Christ. And then finally, for those who aren't so sure about change in the future, I pray that God will put a spirit of excitement in your heart and soul because though we don't know what all the future holds, we know who holds the future. And he's got exciting, good and exciting things in store for us. Yeah, we got to step into it by faith, but that's what it's all about anyway. It's all about faith in him. And if he's been faithful all these years, as we sang about just a few minutes ago, he will be faithful today. He will be faithful tomorrow. And he will be faithful all the tomorrows we have left on this earthly journey. Let's get excited about what God wants to do among us.